right, this is going to be lab number five, where we're looking at AC power and power factor correction. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is building this circuit here. We've got a supply, we've got a probe resistor, which we're going to make 22 ohms because we don't actually have a 10 ohm, and we've got a load network over here. And our goal is to figure out how much power is absorbed by this load network, both the real, reactive, and the uh, parent power of this, and then figure out what capacitor to add in parallel in order to zero out um, the reactive power that's supplied, in order to unify the power factor, bring the power factor to one of this, so that we are going easier on the source network. We'll explain all of that as we go along. The first thing we need to do is account for the fact that the inductor doesn't actually have just inductance, it also has resistance. So what we need to do is take our inductor here and then figure out how much resistance it has by hooking that up to our ohmmeter. So we've got our multimeter in resistance measuring mode. Put that over there and check. Being careful not to hold on to it while we're doing that. So we've got about 213 ohms. This is a little bit different than it was when I measured it the other day. So um, 213, last time I had 209, so I'll just change that to 13. Anyway, uh, at around 210, what we're gonna need in order to add to that, in order to get about 300, is based on the resistors that we have, we can add a 68 ohm and a 22 ohm to get 90 ohms, and that should bring us close to 300. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. So we'll put the inductor down, maybe towards the top there, and then one side of this, we're going to need the 68 ohm, so that's the one with the, with the blue on it there, going to another, another junction. And then from there, via a 22, to the ground. But the ground is not going to be actually on the bottom rail, because we need the, the ground to be on the other side of another 22. So this 30 um, node on the breadboard here is going to be the bottom part here. We'll go from there over to the actual ground of the circuit via another 22 ohm resistor. Okay, so then what we're gonna need to do is connect to the supply from the top part here to the top rail. So we'll do that, connecting to the other side of the inductor there. And we will connect our lows from the top rail to the bottom rail there. Then we can plug in the supply there and we'll be supplying across this whole circuit there. So we could hook up the function generator to the rails here and then measure everything with the scope. But today, just to take advantage of the extra color option that we have over here, we're gonna use this scope instead, which has its own function generator. So we're gonna go on the wave gen menu and check that we have a sine wave frequency of one kilohertz. And we're gonna put the amplitude to one volt peak to peak. So now let's hook up the scope to measure from our low to the top channel here. And then we can hook up the function generator of the scope there. And this gives us a chance to talk about the difference between the setting output and the actual output. So we set the output to a uh, to one volt peak to peak amplitude, but the measured output is two volts peak to peak. And this is because of differences in uh, yeah, impedance matching. So the, the generation out, the setting, is assuming that we're going to be impedance matching for use at high frequency, but because we're not doing that, we're just putting it out to a... Um, we're putting it into uh, a higher impedance than an impedance matched network would give. Then we've got, uh, we've got just a specific output. So this is saying it would be one volt peak to peak at our 50 ohm output, but we've actually got a two volt peak to peak. So even if you have a, an advanced 
function generator like the kind we have in the scope where you can digitally set exactly what your output is, you should definitely go and measure what output you're, you're actually getting out of the box to make sure that it is the one that you think it is. So this is assuming impedance matching, but because we're not doing that, we have to assign this to the, we have to adjust this around so that we have the right amplitude. Now fortunately we wanted one volt peak, not one volt peak to peak, so we're already set with this uh, with this measurement as is. Alright, so now we can hook up the other terminal, the other probe of the scope. Let's turn that on. We can connect our ground if we like, but it's already grounded through the scope. And then measure on the other side of this 22 ohm resistor there. So this signal, if we divide by 2 to get the amplitude, and then divide by root 2 to get the RMS, and then divide by 22 ohms will be the RMS current going through the circuit. So you can see right now that the current is lagging the voltage. And that makes sense because we've got a series circuit with a pretty intense inductive impedance compared to the resistive impedance. And it's lagging by a fairly, uh, a fairly large phase shift. So we've got a relatively low power factor meaning that there's, there's a pretty big reactive part of the power, and this is shifted over uh, that way by a fair bit. Now what we can do in order to measure the real power and the reactive power, what you would do is measure the phase shift digitally using the cursors on your scope to, uh, and combined with the frequency and the period, figure out what fraction of a cycle that is, and use that to determine what your power factor is. And then with the power factor, you can determine the, uh, the real power by taking the RMS voltage and the RMS current, multiplying those two together, and then multiplying by the power factor. And you can find the apparent power by multiplying just the RMS voltage and RMS current without considering the power factor and the phase shift. Since you get billed based on the apparent power, it's a great idea to try and eliminate this phase shift and, uh, and correct the power factor so that you're still getting the same real power delivered to your load. Your load is seeing exactly the same situation as before, but the reactive part of the power is provided by a capacitance in parallel. So as we found out with the analytical part, what we need for this particular circuit is a 0.2 microfarad of capacitance total. And that's what we've got here. We've got two um, 0.1 microfarad capacitors, and we can get 0.2 by putting them both in parallel. So let's see, here is the low part of the load, and we need to put the two capacitors sort of in parallel with that. So that means from this node over to that node. Before we do that though, just to make it a little bit more convenient, I'm gonna hook them up in parallel over to this intermediary point, this intermediate point. And then what I'm gonna do is use a jumper wire so that I can connect them up into the circuit point um, easily with one, with one plug. So now if we look at the scope, we see that we have our current that's phase shifted and higher amplitude, and if we hook up these capacitors, what we should see is that the current phase shifts to line up with the voltage and reduces an amplitude. And there we go. So we've shifted over to the left. Now they're more or less in phase, and the amplitude has reduced so that we have the same real power, but we've zeroed out the reactive power and reduced the apparent power. This is also going to end up reducing the power that's dissipated in our transmission line. So by having less current uh, provided by the source, because now we've got this capacitor there that's able to toss the current back and forth as needed with the inductor, now the source needs to provide less RMS current and so we end up wasting less real power in the transmission line, even though the load sees exactly the same voltage conditions as before. So just to give you a better view of that, what we've done is hooked up the capacitors in parallel with the load part of the branch. That's the 22, the 68, and the um, 22 ohm, 68 ohm, and the 
um, 100 millihenry inductor, which has a 213 ohm resistance inside, so that's the RL part of the load. And we've got the capacitors now in parallel with all of that. And what we're doing is alternately attaching and detaching the capacitors. So without them, we've got a higher RMS current and it's phase shifted, so the same kind of real power, but we've got a lot of reactive power now. And when we attach it, we have pretty much in phase current with voltage. So the, uh, the real power should be the same and the reactive power should have reduced a fair bit. So again, what we've done is we've added a capacitor in parallel and this capacitor was chosen so that it's gonna draw the same RMS current as the imaginary part of the, uh, the imaginary part of the current in this branch, but at the opposite time in a cycle. So anytime this would wanna be drawing current, this would instead uh, be wanting to supply it and vice versa for the imaginary part. So this ends up letting the inductor and capacitor balance and toss the energy that they're storing back and forth between them. So the voltage supply just has to top up the real part of the of the power. And that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.